seven regular basis, which is encouraging. Uh, interesting, I think the need for a car for people's jobs, uh, that was cited as the main reason for people not using the bus, <laughs> rather than being against using the bus per se on principle or for, uh, or for some other uh, reason. And finally, what we've seen from this research is that amongst car users, uh, so the people who generally aren't using the bus, there's a real lack of awareness and understanding around um, how reliable buses are, how much they cost, what the value for money is, what the safety record looks like. So there's some real clear uh, things for us to uh, address there through that marketing and engagement campaign. And the final couple of milestones I just wanted to touch on. Uh, first is a successful trial of ITS bus priority on uh, Route 10. So in simple terms, that's where late running buses are able to talk to the traffic signal system and give those buses a, a green wave for uh, uh, those traffic signals. So that's taken quite a lot of uh, background work, quite a lot of technical uh, work to make that happen. But we've got the systems effectively talking to each other now and a successful trial uh, has happened. We've also introduced the uh, Nodesley network review, which means that we've now completed the first round of uh, bus network reviews across the Merseyside districts. The report outlines a number of other milestones which are kind of in progress, and I'm supposed to go through those in uh, a lot of detail. I'm happy to kind of clarify those in questions at the end. And moving on to the business case for alternative delivery for, uh, for bus, we've now formally commenced the outline business case, uh, business, case business case stage of the process uh, with the last month for publishing the statutory notices. Um, Work will concentrate now on four key phases. So the advanced preparation for that, which is work ongoing, uh, development of option and analytic framework, the economic and financial appraisals of the options and, and the development of draft procurement documentation. So that work is now uh, very much underway. And then now moving on to supporting bus service reform. Um, members will be uh, or remember from previous updates, we've already completed the move of procurement of bus services to the chest and we've migrated um, contracts, every contract now to new terms and conditions. Operators are now returning their, um, their contractual returns in line with these new conditions. So we're very much now in the bedding in process uh, for, uh, for that. The dynamic procurement system, uh, which has now been developed uh, without modelling various combinations of uh, price and quality in our tender evaluations to look at what sort of impacts uh, different weightings uh, will have. But um, wherever that ends up, one thing's for sure that certainly from uh, the April 2019 round, we're going to be starting to measure quality through. Uh, through our tendering process, which I think is a, a real positive step forward for us. <coughs> and just to wrap up the um, remaining sections of the report I've referred to uh, in, in Michelle's presentation, as I mentioned, we've had a flatlining for a number of years now of customer satisfaction around uh, the waiting environment, really refers to stops and shelters. Members might be aware that that's not something that we particularly proactively monitor at the moment. We're very kind of reactive when it comes to um, to stops and shelters. So we react to reports of vandalism, uh, lack of information, cleanliness issues, damage, but we're not we're not proactively seeking those things. I'm a great believer in kind of what gets measured, what get, is what gets done. So um, we're reintroducing now proactive monitoring of uh, of bus stops and shelters, and um, really looking at the quality of those. And that's firstly to get a better understanding of the picture that's uh, out there, but then we want to use that information to drive improvements both internally with our own processes, but also uh, with our suppliers. We've agreed now the internal process around this and we're aiming to trial this new process uh, later in November. Uh, elsewhere, we've been working with Stagecoach and with uh, Volvo to try an electric bus, a different style of electric bus to the ones of Eva. Uh, operate these have what's called pantograph opportunity uh, charging. This technology um, presents some quite interesting future possibilities, I think, including much better vehicle utilization, 
So in theory, these buses don't have to go back to the depot other than for maintenance inspections every uh, every 28 days. So you can get a, an awful lot of use for them uh, because they're having to go back to depots to be uh, to be refueled. <coughs> We've got some interesting learning from that. Uh, we've responded to a couple of uh, consultations in relation to the Bus Services Act, particularly around uh, open data and accessible uh, information. We've also submitted evidence, evidence to the ongoing Transport Select Committee's uh, bus inquiry. We've worked closely with Arriva on the launch of Arriva Click, which is now operating in a, <coughs> uh, initially a defined area between here and Liverpool airports. Uh, and we've also been working with those travel and command authority colleagues and bus operators to introduce uh, apprentice discount cards, uh, which was announced earlier in the summer by the uh, Metro Mayor, with again the intention to introduce this onto the network later this month. So hopefully you can see from the, the uh, reports uh, the level of work that's been undertaken by the team at the moment. So things seem to be positive progress in quite a lot of uh, areas and I'm really happy to take any questions. Excellent, thanks Matt. Loads and loads of stuff there. I've got Steve, I've got Helen, I've got Gordon, and I've got Francis. Yeah, thanks Matt. Um, I mean, clearly this report was written um, in advance, but it, it, it hasn't really mentioned the A1 bus issue at all. Uh, it, it sort of has caused me uh, and certainly members of, of, of my community to, to sort of reflect on the whole issue around that. See, one of the things we're trying to do is encourage people to get, leave the cars at home, use the bus on, on a regular basis, and people make those decisions. And then when something like Avon happens and that bus disappears overnight, it just completely pulls the rug under any campaigning that we're doing because. It, you know, let alone it not being reliable. If it's not there, you've got no chance. Of, and some people in my community have made life decisions based around what they thought the bus service would be, particularly jobs and employment. And now they find themselves in, in particular parts of the community with no um, Sunday or evening service. Uh, as, as much as we like to think the world works nine till five on Friday, Monday to Friday, particularly the care industries and many industries are a seven day a week industry. And the bus services have got to keep up with that, I'm afraid. Uh, and to have <coughs> sort of believe that people don't work on a Sunday, we're living in a, a different age of what the real world is. So if, if you are in communications with, with the bus operators, particularly the types of Avon, and I pay credit, by the way, for the swift response from Mersey Travel coordinating the bidding and replacing many, many of those services. Unfortunately, not all of them have been replaced. I've referred to the 492 and the 495 which now has no evening service and no Sunday service, and the 77, which has gone completely, which runs from Rock Ferry through, through to Hesel, and probably a couple of others that have not been replaced. So I'm asking in your offices to make sure that those are covered, uh, and, and that a reader who's taken some of them over and, and the other operators try and extend that to, to realise what the real world is. It's lead to social isolation and all of the issues around it. So it does undermine us. I'm very, very grateful and I think it's a massive piece of work. The protocol, the bus changes now, where, whereas in the past, the private operator can simply say, bus changing or bus going off, job done. This actually sets them in a, a procedure where we have some input and some debate and a chance to talk before the buses go missing. So, so all in all, you know, we are making progress, but the Avon crisis completely and utterly undermined confidence in the bus market. I'm afraid. Yeah, I think first thing to say is that you write a report that's drafted uh, before uh, before AMAP and we'll certainly be uh, I'll be updating you in the next quarter in a lot more detail on uh, kind of what's happened and how we uh, how we've addressed that. It actually kind of has moved into into quarters of that. But I, I will certainly pick that up in uh, in a future committee. I think the points you make around bus provision are, are, are really valid ones and uh, certainly the, the system, the bus system allows for changes to be made with kind of 70 odd days uh, notice. That, that's the system that, that, we, that we live with at the moment and I'm very aware, as I'm sure you're even more so and, and other members here, that people make decisions about where they're going to live based on things like transport networks and if those 
change those can severely affect people's lives. Certainly one of the reasons why we put the new protocol in place, and that was certainly something that we've heard in, in, in this room, something that we wanted in, in place. So whilst it doesn't give us a veto over decisions, it means that at least people are heard through that process and that those sorts of things are brought out and, uh, and understood. Um, in terms of the aim on replacements, because we're still in the procurement process, there's only so much I can uh, say on that, but certainly what we uh, plan to introduce from Monday next week, I think is better than it might have otherwise been, but there are certainly there are gaps, and you refer to evenings and, and weekends uh, in, in, in particular as, as being things that we would certainly wish to see, but we haven't been able to, uh, to provide, a, just to set into some context, to directly replace everything that Avon did would have cost us as an authority around an extra million pounds, which is something that, that we, we're not able to, uh, to afford at the moment. So uh, what we've tried to do is, within the money that we've got available, come up with the best solution. What we've said is that if we're going to prioritise something or one thing or another, we're going to try and focus on the, on the daytime service provision, but we do recognise that that it is not as, uh, as comprehensive a network as we would like to see. I think I'd just add as well before I bring Helen in next that I think you've hit the nail on the head, Steve, about how uh, this is a good example of how the current deregulated approach doesn't work. You know, the fact that there isn't that kind of resilience that if an operator unfortunately goes out of business, there isn't anything that quickly steps in, which that wouldn't happen in somewhere like London where there's a different approach. Equally, when we look at the finances, I agree with you 100%. Our team have done an exceptional job to sort of pull together in difficult circumstances the best possible coverage. But the fact that at this moment in time we're not able to use revenues from the commercially successful groups that operators take the revenue from to support those really important socially necessary services that are frankly lifelines for your constituents and many other people in similar circumstances across the region. I think you've really hit that nail on the head and obviously we're looking at how we're going to be using devolved powers in order to look at that in a completely different way. But by the same token, I think you highlighted equally how it's really good that we have